Once on his show, Bill Maher mentioned the high rates of support for the death penalty for the crime of atheism in Muslim communities. In response, Dean Obidala, who is a comedian and author and a liberal Muslim, attempted to defend the Muslim countries by pointing out errors in the statistics Maher used. Let me quote his piece on CNN. He says, a 2013 Pew poll actually found that only 64% of Egyptians supported this. By this he means de the death penalty. Still alarmingly high, but not 90%. And only 13 Muslim nations have penalties for apostasy, while 34 do not. Now, can we realistically imagine something like that being published if it was about any other minority in an honest effort to downplay the horror? What if it was only 64% of Americans support the death penalty for converts to Islam? Muslims don't have it that bad. Only 64% of French citizens support the death penalty for Algerian immigrants, or only 64% of Americans support the death penalty for homosexuality. How bad is the situation, how terrible the human rights abuses, and how little the worth of the life of a human being when 64% is viewed as a defensive statistic? If the situation was that a fully third of Western nations had legalized the murder of Muslims, how appalled would we be? what would the left's reaction be? As an ex-Muslim, I am horrified that something like this would be published on a website of a major news organization and not a single voice was raised in outrage. Why is my life worth less? Does my simply being raised in an Islamic tradition grant the Islamic religious right over, over ownership over me and my body? Grant them license to murder me and my fellow atheists? The claim actually being made by citing this statistic was that Maher was supposedly making too much of a fuss of atheist persecution by Muslims. Now, I do not wish to denigrate the author, Dean Obitala, but to illustrate the depth of the problem, that in trying to defend what he perceived to be an injustice to Muslims, he didn't even notice the depravity of what he wrote. As a consequence, an audience on the left now frightens me nearly as much as an audience of Islamists does. I've had to think long and hard about whether I want to give this talk today, to what extent I should mince my words, and what consequence it would have on my work. It's not my intention to cause offense, but I firmly believe that there are things that need to be said, elephants in the room that no one but some bigots on the far right are willing to acknowledge. We are all, I hope, familiar with what happened on January 7th at the offices of Charlie Hebdo. Masked gunmen killed 12 people, shouting Allahu Akbar, later revealed to be two brothers, French nationals of Algerian origin. There was global outrage and a large show of solidarity for the cartoonists, which appeared to be the obviously righteous things to do, until, of course, the religious began to speak up with claims of provocation and hurt feelings. But that was to be expected. Islamists have been saying that for years, and indeed, no religion really accepts any form of ridicule if they have a choice in the matter, that is to say. However, what was more distressing to me was the response from many of my allies on the left. Over and over, I heard the claim that Charlie Hebdo was somehow a racist publication. And while, of course, of course, murder is always wrong and should be condemned, it is nonetheless understandable that the gunman would feel provoked by the cartoons. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to meet the man who understands why someone would feel compelled to murder another man because he didn't like a cartoon they drew. It's important to realize that mocking and critique are not that different in the eyes of the most religious people. There is no amount, fair amount of fair and friendly criticism that the very religious will accept if they have the power to shut it down as evidenced by the prohibition on heretical speak, speech in theocratic states throughout history. There is a curious double standard at play when Muslim clerics, clerics and activists that are known to be anti-Semites and homophobes are welcomed on campuses, touring nationally, invited to give lectures by Muslim student associations, while feminists like Asra Nomani, who has been fighting for equality of the sexes, for the right to female entry to the priestly class, is branded as a bigot by the same Muslim student organization. And the authorities at universities like Duke succumb to this brazen attempt to silence her. 
Similar patterns are repeated across the Western world. Maryam Namazi, who is an ex-Muslim activist, was disinvited to speak at Trinity. Ayan Hirsi Ali at Brandeis. The British Student Union now allies itself broadly with, the Islam with Islamist organizations such as CAGE. To quote Nick Cohen from his article from The Guardian, university managers are no better than their teenage heresy hunters. They say they want to oppose radical Islam in argument. The lawyers' secular society took them at their word. It tried to present an investigation at the University of West London into Islamist groups that were all over campuses, despite their record of advocating Jew hatred, homophobia, and misogyny. The university authorities banned the secularists. Let me be clear. I don't think anyone, even bigots emerging from Muslim communities or anywhere else, should be silenced. What I ask is that we stand up for the right to speak of all, including those, both those who stand with us and those who call for the death of our fellow disbelievers. Our society functions because we believe that hurt feelings mean essentially nothing in the eyes of our justice system. But of course, it is claimed that this is a special case because these aren't just personal hurt feelings, these are religious hurt feelings, and not just any religion, but the religion of the underdog, of the brown man. And the left decided long ago that the hurt feelings of the Christian religion mattered, mattered little, and it was imperative that we disabuse the notion that Christianity would ever feel safe from criticism or even outright mockery. Indeed, many of our greatest thinkers have delighted in exercising this right. I want to quote Thomas Paine from his, public, his book, The Age of Reason. Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictive vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we call it the word of a demon than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind, and for my part, I sincerely detest it, as I detest everything that is cruel. I wonder if Paine had been murdered for his outright contempt of Christianity, how different would the West look today? What message such a gruesome deed would have sent? How many people would it have silenced with its promise of more bloodshed to come if they had the audacity to repeat his crime? Would that fear have silenced those who, who insisted on the freedom of speech? How would that have affected the face of our nation? Now, I hope you will reflect on me that the, on the fact that not only was he not murdered, neither was his contemporaries who, were, who mocked religion. Also, even then, three centuries ago, I don't believe he contemplated the idea that writing would actually lead to his death. And yet, in the 21st century, this is the reality of those who speak out against Islam in Muslim countries, and increasingly in Western ones. 